You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, I'm Ariel Nissenblatt from Earbuds Podcast Collective and Squadcast.fm. Katie and Nathan asked me to stop by and give you a heads up that they use strong language in the show, so listener discretion is advised. And since you are obviously a fan of podcasts, if you want to get more podcast recommendations, you can subscribe to my newsletter, Earbuds Podcast Collective. You can get it by going to earbuds.audio. That's the website. And then you'll get five podcast episodes on a theme each week curated by a different person. Enjoy the show. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. everybody. Nathan, how are you? Fantastic. So what are we talking about today, Katie? Today, we are talking about Rani Lakshmi Bai, or as she's also sometimes known, Rani of Jhansi, who is an Indian queen who gave a big old middle finger to the British when they tried to take control over her part of India. So, yes, bitch. Warrior she's queen. A- yes, and that's why I had to make this super refreshing drink that is a take on a Moscow mule. Mm -hmm. So I did like a Moscow mule, but with Indian spices. So essentially I made my own ginger beer. That's what I found out. (laughs) Like I made, uh, I took like a bunch of ginger, a buttload of ginger um, to be exact. (laughs) (laughs) How do you measure that out? I literally took like, a big old ginger root. And if you can see me right now, <laughs> they can't, they, they can't. can't. It's a podcast. A big old ginger root. And I chopped it up, boiled it with a little bit of stevia, cardamom, cumin, and coriander. Those mm. are the, those are the spices. Mm. And then boiled that down into a nice little syrup. And then, Mixed it with sparkling water. I made my own ginger beer, y'all. And then I put like a little bit of vodka, two shots. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it was delicious. So you mix all that together with lime juice and garnish with the lime and mint. And you've got your Indian mule for our Indian mule of a bitch. This is delicious. Thank you for... Uh, some, that doesn't sound like it was an easy one to make. So thank you no, for... No, it wasn't. It was... It, and she's a little bit complicated. <laughs> You're a little bit extra with your drinks, but this is this so is, is our great. girl. She's also extra. Yeah. Before we get into her, though, let's do a couple of Patreon shout outs. <laughs> so first, we wanted to say thank you to Catherine, Nicole, Ali, Maggie, and Jasmine. Also, thank you to Bryce, Cassidy, Danielle, Donnie, and Taylor. Also, I want to say thank you to Aubrey. I posted on Instagram being like, anybody want to help us with some of these pronunciations? And she was so cute. She sent me over a video of her partner's mom, who is, uh, who, I, who I believe lives in India, doing some pronunciations for us. So thank you so much, Aubrey. That was so nice. Um, however, we are still going to completely fuck up. Sorry. All right. Well, let's get into her life. Rani Lakshmi Bai was born November 19th, 1828, though some sources do have her a little bit younger, like um, seven years younger. But either way, our girl is a Scorpio. So Nathan, tell us about Scorpios. This fits her to a T. She's very Scorpio. Like, <laughs> she has got the Scorpio vibes. She's brave, determined, ambitious. She's a little bit jealous. She's a little bit resentful. I mean, this is her. Yeah. All around. Absolutely. Um, As for the age discrepancy, though, we are going to go with the 1828 birthday. It just makes more sense in this story, in my opinion. Yeah. It's most traditionally believed. As we talk about it more, it just seems to make more sense. It's problematic. Yeah. Wasn't it uh, Anne Boleyn? Aren't her two different dates of birth seven years? Like the discrepancy between her year. Aren't that, isn't that also seven years difference? Right. Oh, look at that. Look, look, look at that Brit history. Look, look, I cannot <laughs> remember where I put my keys on any given day, but shit like that. I just remember off the top of my head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so at the time of her birth, she was given the name of Manikarnika Tambe. We've discussed several times on this show that their name changes. Yeah. So 
BT Dubs. It's her OG name. And like we've discussed, like with Empress Wu, and you know, we've just had other women on this show that like their name changes with like their status. That's not the name that she's known as through history. You know, yeah, she's- Ronnie. Ronnie is like queen. Yeah. Ronnie means queen. And I found this very interesting. Is that, but yeah, yeah, queen consort. But I found this very interesting. It's like Ranya. Ranya means queen in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very interesting to see how dialects mix. And Lakshmi Bai was the name she adopted after her marriage, after the Hindu goddess Lakshmi. So, yeah. But all of her friends and family called her Manu, which I think is very cute. Uh, yes, and are you ready for a rabbit hole? Because there's going to be several. <laughs> this is the first rabbit hole of many. Before like prefacing everything, Hinduism isn't something that us Westerners delve into a whole lot. This is our first Hindu queen that we've covered. So like, yeah, I haven't researched this part of the world before. Yes, and the city she was born in was in the modern day city of Varanasi. And Varanasi is considered one of the seven holy cities, and some view it as the holiest of the seven cities. And it's believed that that if you die in Varanasi, you will end the cycle of death and rebirth. I'll link to this YouTube video that I watched. Like, it's, yeah, it's believed if you die there, you're done with your lives. And um, so people will, like, go there to die. That's dark, but I'm okay with it. But it's also like just part of the culture of that city. I mean, death is a part of life, you know? Yes. Yeah. I, I just, I found that really interesting and it was just a really weird little rabbit hole that I didn't expect to go down. <laughs> Katie's like, I'm a Pisces. <laughs> <laughs> this is my last life anyway. I'm a Pisces. <laughs> but she was born to a pretty well-to-do family. She would have been considered like middle nobility. Basically, her father was this guy named Mora Pant and or Mora Pant, and he worked for the Indian equivalent of like the prime minister, which is a yeah. which is a title called the Peshva. And the Peshva was a guy named Baji Rao. We need to touch on him just a little bit because I think it's important. Baji Rao was more or less like a puppet ruler. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Surprise, surprise. The British put a puppet in power. Mm-hmm. <laughs> put the Yeah, the British put him in power and he didn't because, you know, it was under British rule, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah, they just wanted somebody that they could control, basically. Dad's job was kind of a big deal. Dad yeah, was, was kind of a big deal in India. He was very high up in the military and worked very closely with the Peshva to create policies. So from a really young age, our girl would have been no stranger to war and politics and all the drama that goes on with that. So let's get back to her family life. Yeah. So her dad, Morpant, and her mom, we know nothing about her parents' marriage, unfortunately. But sadly, also, we don't know basically anything about her mom because she died and she was only like four years old. So yeah. again, we don't have that mother daughter relationship. Yeah. Raised primarily by her father at the court of Peshva. Which that, I mean, that sucks that we just don't know anything about like what her I mother know. died and- of or like what. Yeah. Like, uh. So we don't have any knowledge of her having any siblings. So her dad, like, he was like, I got one shot at raising a badass kid. I need to keep, I, I'm not throwing yes. away my shot. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not giving away my shot. 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 <laughs> okay, any chance that you get Katie and For Nathan Hamilton. Sting in Hamilton. There we go. He's not throwing he away it. his shot. <laughs> but did dad succeed? Yes. As, yes. As a, parental unit yes <laughs> he ma- he was like i got I, I gotta make this kid known i gotta do well by her and he absolutely did for sure yeah she was educated she was home reading and writing cool girls don't get that chance in life no yeah it seems like at this time even with the nobility girls weren't really taught to read and write he was basically giving her a boy's education for the time yeah she learned shooting horsemanship yeah fencing like these are not in the realm of feminism at the time and we are here for it yeah it's unusual and 
we see you. We Ms. see you. Independent. Yeah. Do you remember <laughs> when we covered Amina of Zarya? Yeah. It's given me that vibe. Like, cause she yes. was raised basically like a boy and taught to fight and lead armies. I mean, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that the parent was like, I wish you were a boy, but we're here. Here we are. But he could, I mean, <laughs> it would have been completely acceptable for society yeah. at the time for him to be like, and she fuck that daughter. Never, she would have never been who she is if she wasn't raised the way she was. You know, this is a show about women in history, but we got to have allies. And it sounds like he was someone that was all for, you know, girls can be equal. Girls can be smart. Girls can be special too. So, hey, dad. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right? And she was way ahead of any kid her age. She would have been that little kid that was like having full on conversations with adults and being like, but why? But why? But tell me. But why? Yeah. But why? why and discuss things that <laughs> seemed like way, o- that should be way over her head. Yeah. Yeah. And she's a little bit of what we would call a tomboy. Like she's definitely got those vibes of. I don't care what you think. I don't care about um, wearing dresses. What? I don't care about... I read, like, she liked to wear turbans. Mm. That was specifically just for men. There was no androgyny in, like, the way that people were supposed to dress. I love this for her. Yeah. She's already breaking barriers. Yes. <laughs> Manu would have spent a lot of time with the other kids of the people that worked at the court of the Peshva. But mostly those kids that were brought to court, almost exclusively, were boys. So that probably also explains why she was a bit of a quote-unquote tomboy she only ever hung out with little boys, you know, like she wasn't hanging out with other little girls though. The Peshva at the time gave her nicknames, which translate into English of basically meaning like beautiful, lively child. So Preach. yes. Me? So this is, uh, this is the, me, a uh, little old me You're calling me a beautiful, oh, lively child. Darling. <laughs> so that's kind of the only time we really get a description of, I mean, it's not even a description of what she looks like, but we have to assume that she would have been considered pretty for the time. Yes. Yeah. Would it be normal for girls Inc. to act like this? Absolutely not. Horseback riding, <laughs> fencing, playing with the boys. Because she would, she would like fight with the boys. There was one story that I read where one of the boys at court had an elephant and he wouldn't let her ride it. And so she was like, fuck you, one day I'm going to have 300 elephants and you're not going to get to ride any of those. And it's like, are we talking about that boy on any podcast these days? No. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking to Ronnie of Chanzi. <laughs> and I bet she did have elephants. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. <laughs> but Indian culture compared to Western culture, very conservative, even in today's standards. Very much so. So let's rewind the hands of time. <laughs> Yep, that's how we rewind. <laughs> and it was super out of the ordinary yeah. to be an independent woman at the time. Women were expected to be housewives, and that's it. Yeah. Arranged marriages were a big thing. I think they still are. Um, they are. I've been watching a, a lot of Indian Matchmaker. Do you ever watch that show? <laughs> <laughs> Katie's like, I am an expert. <laughs> I'm an expert on this because I have seen two and a half it. seasons of this crappy Netflix show. <laughs> But no, like, so I, I mean, at least on that show, it doesn't seem like in any of the people that she's setting up, the people that are like our age, our generation aren't doing it. But a lot of them will have their parents on and their parents will be like, well, yeah, we were in arranged marriage. So yeah, it still seems to be a relevant part of the culture. But yeah, once you were married back then, you weren't expected to use your brain. Like, you know, it was just, all right, you're a housewife, you serve your husband, I mean, it's kind of the same vibes that the Brits have been giving for years. It's like, hey, you're prize cattle. Yay, we're going to sell you off for a dowry. All of history ever. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, luckily today there's, you know, there's more rights. Things are definitely more progressive than they were in the 1800s. But, and while Ronnie of John Z didn't grow up with that, she was the trailblazer. Like, yeah. if you look back at it, but they're all going to be like, Ronnie and John C. She's a uh, huge, she's still a huge figure of national pride in India. Mm-hmm. And she also happened to have a uterus. So, <laughs> oh, love no, she can't think. She has a <laughs> uterus. Oh. Okay, before we go any further, I do think we need to take a quick dive into a history lesson regarding the political layout of India at the time. Like we kind of mentioned a little bit already, you know, the Brits were there. This is going to be a huge oversweeping, like sweeping oversimplification because this shit is complicated, but you need to understand a couple of things. In the 1600s, the British landed in India 
and set up what is known as the East India Company. They were primarily there to trade for spices, but as the British Empire was wont to do, they soon started colonizing and trying to spread Christianity. Yeah, so eventually this trading company got backing from the crown and the parliament, and the British government started sending the English, the East Indian... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the English military forces, yeah. basically. Right. <laughs> and now somehow this trading post is basically colonizing and taking over. It's, it's so confusing because like the East Indian trading company is like, it's not the British government. It's a trading company that was getting tax money and an army. So it was, it's just, it's so weird. I don't like, cause I, and the Brits are gonna Brit Brit. Brit. Brits are gonna Brit 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 Brit. Brit. <laughs> it, it was just so strange because, like, we've read a lot about. I mean, the British people weren't the only, wasn't the only empire mm-hmm. colonizing the. Oh my gosh, Portuguese were all over the place. Spanish were all over the place. But I've never. I, this was the first one where I saw where I was like, what started as a trading post turned into <laughs> running a major country. Like, India is <laughs> big. India is <laughs> huge. You know, like yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> like that, I, I just. I didn't even bother going too deep down that rabbit hole because I knew I would never get out. She would have been like the NBC hit show, Lost. Lost. I would have been lost for six seasons. So it's it's also worth noting that at the time of Ronnie of Johnsy, India wasn't a united country Mm -hmm. that we think of today. So if you listen to our Grania O'Malley episode, it was kind of like that. Right. Like state, local, leadership, kind of things and also in that episode many of the rulers would recognize the authority of the british and and the british would more or less allow people to live autonomously and promise not in, no 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 drama no, no yeah no, like no like if you recognize <laughs> us if you recognize us and you pay us some taxes we're gonna take care of you and we're mm-hmm. not gonna interfere with your shit um, and yep. not interfere with your religion. Do you remember? A spoiler alert, they did. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, there's this one Eddie Izzard bit where he's talking about like when the British came and colonized America and talking to the Native Americans. And it's like, yes, there's more of us coming, but don't worry. We, we always keep our promises. <laughs> <laughs> I love Eddie Izzard. I know. I How know. can you not? I know. <laughs> and that's, that's, that, uh, when I was reading that, that just kept popping into my mind. Like, don't worry. <laughs> yes, there's more of us coming, but don't worry. We always keep our promises. <laughs> So in return, the East India Company would help them build schools and roads and, you know, infrastructure. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. And no, I would say colonization you know, usually is a bad thing. Yeah, it is. But one thing that I thought was really cool is um, with the colonization that the Brits were doing, they were doing some really cool stuff for women, like building schools for girls. But then it turned into this whole thing that of like... If you sent your girl to that school for girls, you were looked at, like, society looked down on you. But there were, so colonization isn't always a good thing, but sometimes, I mean, roads and schools for girls is pretty cool. It's pretty cool, that's right? Not, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> and so It's complicated. Brit- it's too complicated to <laughs> sum up in a few minutes. <laughs> way too culturally complicated for me. Yeah. I can't. I yes. Can't. The Brits started modernizing india by opening more trade more routes more buildings more roads more schools and the natives are loving it because they're getting more money yeah. because in the words of notorious big mo money more problems more money more problems because <laughs> slowly slowly they start to manipulate the government right just piece by piece right yeah they hmm. just kind of start tweaking shit and it's also important to remember this is this is only like what 40 50 years after the united states revolutionary war and so mm-hmm. I think the Brits also maybe have a little bit of like a chip on their shoulder of like PTSD. We need to do it better <laughs> this time. Um, yeah. But no, this is all important. We promise. However, I'm, not, I'm thinking like <laughs> British people at the time looking at themselves going, do better. Like it just in a mirror, just looking in a mirror, like colonize better. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, no, but this is super important. We promise, while you kind of let that history lesson sink in, Nathan, I'm going to go top off my drink. Why not? Why not? Let's do it. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back. And now let's get back into the story. Yeah, Mandy was 
really well connected, growing up at a political court, and her dad's a pretty big deal, guys. Mm-hmm. So when the Maharaju, you know, the king, king, basically, that's yeah. basically what that is. Yeah. Um, he's the king of a place called John Z, and he's putting out a casting call for wives. Yeah. Like, hurt him up. I need a wife. Prize cattle. Bring him okay. in. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and so in this casting call, he sends his dudes out to Varanasi to check out Manu. He was like, oh, I heard that this one high ranking political official over there has a cute daughter. Let's go check her out. Mm-hmm. And this was in 1842, which is why we're thinking, like, hopefully 1828 is her birth year. Because it's like, uh, she would have been 14 versus 7. Yeah. Let's so, not. So 14 is <laughs> fourteen is gross, but at least it's post-puberty. Not seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. This is where we are. The Maharaja, who we'll get to know a little bit more later, was searching for a wife that he could make babies with sooner rather than later. Because it was this big thing that we will get into. And seven-year-olds can't make babies anytime soon. Ugh. And so, yeah, gross. Gross to think about. But still, this is why this is why I think that she was 14 and not seven. Because if he's like, I need to make babies sooner rather than later, why would you look for a child? Ugh. What? I hate, I hate it, it here. I hate it here. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now... There's this story that we read about how Manu's dad had her horoscope read when she was younger. Oh, I loved this. I loved this. Apparently, this was something that was really common, not just back then, but today still, um, to have your kids horoscope read before you're arranging a marriage. I mean, they have marriages that their gowns are based on the astrological signs like it's a whole oh really i mean yes again to bring sorry to mention indian matchmaker so many times but yeah (laughs) like sometimes when she's like matching a a couple of her clients she'll bring their chart to like a a astrologer who will like read their charts and be like oh yes this will be a good match this will be a bad match so whenever i saw this on here i when i'm doing this research i was just like Ah, oh, that is so cool. Like, <laughs> I would never actually base a marriage myself on something like that. But, Probably not a good idea. But, I mean, but it's a, it's a pretty cool, it was just, it was just a cool thing. I just thought it was yeah, cool. Yeah, and Manu's horoscope <laughs> didn't match with anybody. In her, in her, like, clan, like, where they lived in Varanasi, yeah. They were like, oh, she's going to be hard-headed. She's going to be a bitch. She's going to try to overpower her husband. So none so of the boys... why boy- not make her queen? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, this sounds right. <laughs> the families in her native neighborhood were like, no, we're not marrying any of our sons to this girl who's going to want to rule the marriage. Yeah, so why not queen? <laughs> but whether it's true or not, this rumor stays around, and it's good that it does. It's part of her it's legend, like- yeah her legend it's yeah. who she is she wasn't meant to be matched with anybody she's she's gonna bullshit she's gonna, on her she's own she's gonna have 300 <laughs> elephants bitch get out get out of here <laughs> yeah so who knows if that's true but it's just a fun part of the story so we have no idea if that's why manu was chosen in the end but we knew we do know that john z and Varanasi are not close to each other mm-hmm. at all Today, that's about a 10-hour drive in a car. So back Ooh. then, whenever I'm trying to calculate how far it would be to travel, like, by horse or carriage or <laughs> something Google like that. She maps it I, and then walks and then doubles it. I put it on Google Map and I put it on bike. Because you can put it, like, by, <laughs> by car, by walking, or by bike. With, like, taking a break to rest and stuff, that's probably, like, two or three days, you know? Yeah, yeah. And she wasn't going to be seeing her family at all. She's not anything she's like 14 i know so this is a big scary with all of our queens that's always one of my least favorite parts of their stories is thinking about how scared they must be going at 14 going to live with a stranger in a place they've never been to before so oh that just sounds so scary scary but we really couldn't find anything about her journey to john z though I did read that her dad was given a resident in John Z as part of her wedding agreement, okay. AKA dowry. Yeah. So hopefully that means that he traveled with her. Um, we hope, we hope. And they remained close. I mean, if he, if he had a house there and he didn't come visit, 
that would have been a bitch move. So I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm really hoping yeah. they remained close. In my mind, they had a really nice close relationship. So, yeah. And th- like we said, this is a very scary journey for being 14. Yeah. Like I was just entering high school. And yeah. Um, mm. So either way, what we do know is that she is definitely in Johnsy by May 1842. And in that month, she married the Maharaja of Jhansi, a guy named Gangadhar Rao. And forgive me if I get if I have that all <laughs> wrong. I did. We got a review the other day that was like, "Oh my god, just look up the pronunciations on YouTube." And it's like one. Which one? Yes. Which pronunciation? There's, there's so many different <laughs> pronunciations on YouTube, and also if I try to say it like in the the way that Indian people say it, it just sounds like I'm. Oh. It sounds terrible. Yeah, like, so Gangadhar Rao (laughs) is how the best I can do here. He would have been 28 and Manu is 14. So that is gross. Yeah. At least he wasn't like 62, though, because we've definitely seen that shit before, too. Oh, we have, and this is problematic. It's not going to get any less Let's just move on. Let's just (laughs) move on. Let's just talk about the wedding. Yeah. Because they allocated... 40,000 rupees for the occasion, Mm. which is like the equivalent of 150K in, you know, modern day United States. That's the best I could do. There's a website called in 2013 dollars and you can put, (laughs) you can put the year you want and the, the year you want it to like compare to the year now. And it'll tell you like the conversion rate. So first I had to convert rupees to dollars because I don't know how much. (laughs) And then I had to pop it in there. So that is my best guess about 150,000, which is that would have been a lot back then for a wedding. They're just partying in the streets. Yeah. Like, you know, let's be real. Yeah. They're dancing in the streets. Fireworks, <laughs> cannon shot off. And like, that's back when fireworks were kind of rare, you know? So uh, to do fireworks, you have to be a bajillionaire, basically, you know, anyway. And yeah, feasting, the whole town was feasting. It was a huge fucking celebration so i know and we're not sure if it's truth or legend but the wedding at gangtahar would have been realized that like this is his wife he would have been like okay we've got it so there's this tradition in india that you tie the bride and the groom's garments together yeah so the bride is supposed to act like shy and coy oh what are you doing and (laughs) and the story goes that when they tie the bride and groom together, Manu very loudly says, better tie it tight. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, fuck yeah, I'm your fucking queen now. Tie that shit tight, because you are not getting away. <laughs> ah, I love it. That would have been like, a scandal, though, because the bride spoke at all, and that she said something so bold. Like, people... I love this. People would have been talking, like, did you fucking hear what she said on her wedding day? Like... She's got a mouth on her, and I love it. Yes! <laughs> yes! And now Manu is given the title of Ronnie. Yes. Um, But she's not Ronnie Manu. No. She has to take on a regal name. So she chooses the official name to be Rani Lakshmibai. And this is after the major Hindu goddess... Lakshmi. I think it might be fun on Patreon to do maybe an episode on the goddess Lakshmi. What do you think? I could go down several rabbit Please holes. Please <laughs> do. I was thinking about that. I didn't have time to go down a rabbit hole on her except to like just get the top, like the bullet points. So yeah, let's do that. But like, yeah, let's take a quick detour just to kind of learn the high points about the goddess Lakshmi. Surprise, surprise. She's the goddess of fertility. Since, of course, Manu's main job is to make them babies on babies on babies on babies. <laughs> but Lakshmi is also really interested, interesting for other reasons. She's closely associated with Maya, which is a Hindi like Buddhism thing, which is magic and illusion is what Maya means, illusion. Um, she's also the goddess of wealth, passion, power. And, you know... She's going to get her own episode, so let's just just leave her. (laughs) She was probably still known as Manu, like, amongst her friends and, like, you know, her close relations. But in public, she is now Rani Lakshmibai. Also, she's married now, y'all. So, you know, let's get to know the hubby a little bit more. Um, (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that was cringeworthy, <laughs> as it should be. So the Maharaja of Jhansi, Gangdahar, uh, was twice her age. Gross. Yeah. And this was his second marriage. Gross. And his first <laughs> wife had died, and so did the son he had from the first marriage. To tag along with the story of Ronnie's horoscope, the legend is also that Gangadhar's horoscope shit showed up that didn't make him a super uh, desirable husband for families to, like, welcome in, even though he was the king, you know? And therefore, no one wanted to marry their daughter to him. And that's why he went so far as to go all the way to Varanasi to find, like, this girl was completely plucked out of obscurity, basically, because he really really needed to have a son which we will get into a little bit later on why but like it was like oh i need to i need to be making them babies soon yeah something we should mention about the system with the british east india company is that they wanted things done the brit way (laughs) when it came to succession this is so much like the grania o'malley episode when it comes to it is like they just basically make you into what they want right to be so if a king does not have a legitimate heir when he dies then the right to name the next maharaja goes to guess who (gasps) the brits (laughs) hello Hello, governor. Hello. Hello. Spot a tea. Sorry. Um, (laughs) My British husband is probably in the next room being like, what the fuck is she doing? So, (laughs) no, it was a policy called the Doctrine of Lapse. Mm -hmm. And legitimately, it was like set up as like a back channel for the the British to find like a loophole to seize control. They're like, we're not here to take over your lands, take over your customs, unless we absolutely can. And it basically, <laughs> it basically stated if the current Maharaja died without a male heir, then the Brits get to decide who rules that part of India. And as one might expect, everyday Indians thought this doctrine of lapse was total bullshit. You know, no one really thought the Brits would like actually enact it. You're not going to really take over this, right? Much and less, they all thought wrong. Yeah, narrator <laughs> voice, they were incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to Gangadhar. And he's a pretty popular ruler. Yeah, people like him. His older brother had kind of fucked up the economy and just wasn't generally good at leading. So when Gangadhar hits the scene, he was very much like, okay, now, John Z, let's get, let's get information. information. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and he more or less brings order, and everything is in order in the land, and everybody seems to love him. He helps John Z get their shit back together after his brother had just kind of fucked everything up, basically. Yeah. So everyone liked him, and they liked him so much that they looked the other way for at his very... For the time, scandalous hobbies. Mm -hmm. So the first hobby, which doesn't seem that weird, he loved the arts. (sighs) He specifically loved the theater. Okay, where's my husband? He (laughs) specifically loved to play the female parts in shows. So he loved to dress up as women and play Mm. the lead woman in a play which Mm. um you know you might because you know he was really Mm. into the arts so maybe he's thinking like shakespearean being like because you know in shakespeare's time men played the women he's living out his non-binary life (laughs) this is about 120 years after charles ii said actually women can just do theater it's fine so um this was a hobby of his that like People just were like, but he's a good king, so just look the other way. You know? Just look the other way. Yeah. Like uh, our king likes to dress in women's clothes. Yeah, uh, like he he's he's chilling with his friends who are mostly who are women, mostly women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he felt so close to them. He could, you know, he would always recognize four days a month of untouchability when yeah. women would seclude themselves because of you know the period. Yeah, it was like this part of the culture back then. Yeah, women. Specific women that could afford to because they're of nobility would like seclude themselves while they're on their periods and then go through like this ritual um, when they're off their periods where they can like be back in society, which you know what? I know it's a form of oppression, but that actually sounds nice. Like, 
<laughs> you're on your period. He's like, I need four days. You're on your period. <laughs> you can't go to work. You can't go to the groceries. You can't do any chores. You got to just sit at home. <laughs> Katie's like, and watch, and watch, and watch a Dean matchmaker for four days. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, a Dean matchmaker and Bridgerton. And Bridgerton. That's what this is. Sign me the fuck up. But I know, <laughs> but, but so, um, do you, he would recognize four days of the month of his like untouchability, which I mean, even He's now, even now I would, if little, some, little trans. Just a little, like he, he he might be. It's so We're not saying. it's so it's such a weird, complicated area to try to look at these people with modern lenses yeah, of things we're like we're in twenty twenty three brain, yeah, right? and we yeah. are seeing you know gender fluidity that didn't happen <laughs> in the nineteenth century, <laughs> but for nineteenth century India, in how they would have viewed it. In the words of the famous scholar Hank Hill, he would have said, that boy ain't right. <laughs> uh, oh, she brought it there. And she's bringing it back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we uh, we recognize gender fluidity then, now, but that's not really something in this culture that was relevant. So it was very... That he must have been such a good king for them to just yeah, look the other like, way. Yeah. That's the whole point is like... The people of John Z liked him so much that he obviously was doing something right. But they were like, just like, oh. they wouldn't have been like, oh, this guy likes to be yeah. a every now Yeah, I thought and that then. was really interesting. No um, big deal. Like, it was MBD. It might MBD. also explain why the families of the more prominent, you know, the more prominent families didn't want to marry their daughters to him. Yeah. It might have had nothing to do with his horoscope. They were like, he does what? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> so. True. It, yeah. True. So that but was another I'll, rabbit hole I went down. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole another one. But at the end of the day, was the marriage a happy one? Uh, oh, yeah, Katie. Katie said it best. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say anything. Um, <laughs> there's not a whole lot that we know definitively about the marriage. Yeah. It seems like at first he was not interested and hanging out with his wife, which he was I mean, twenty eight, she was surprised. fourteen. Of course, he went like that's <laughs> what the fuck are they going to talk fine. about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there is one account which linked in the show notes that suggests that he was kind of an assholey husband. Yeah. Um, he kept her under lock and key, wouldn't let her go anywhere, see anybody except for her ladies in waiting, and then in some stories, he never really warmed up to her and. They never really got along. In some stories, they said that she eventually won him over with, guess what, girls? Her wit. Yeah. Being a stubborn bitch. Yeah. So, um, I love this. So, like, this is my vibe. It sucks, though. <laughs> so there don't seem to be any personal, like, diaries or letters that survive of her. There are, like, letters that she, like, from, like, the political standpoint that survived from her. There's, she didn't keep a diary. She didn't, like, write to any of her, I don't think she had any girlfriends, so she didn't, like, write letters. So we just don't know if it was she happy. She wrote a letter to her horse. It was miserable. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I love she, her. she was such a horse girl. Yeah. So, yes. um, now 14, we can all agree, is way too young to be having babies. Preach. <laughs> We're happy to say she did not have babies at the age of 14. She also didn't have babies at the age of 15 oh. or 16 oh. or 18 Uh oh. or 20. Uh oh. So for nine years, yeah. she remained pretty not knocked up. Un- um. <laughs> unknocked up. Knocked down. She was... <laughs> Knocked down. Oh, that's a new Queen's podcast statement. I wish we knew more. Like, did her husband resent being married to her? Or was he just so icked out by the thought of sex with a girl? Like, I... They're not compatible sexually. Let's just, let's just Who throw knows? that out. Or were one of both of them just, you know, not... Uh, okay. not ding-dong problems. Ding-dong problems, maybe, ding-dong you problems. know? I mean, both. Maybe both. Are the stories of him just neglecting her true? But hot take, hot take. Okay. Uh, She probably just had a hard time getting pregnant. You think so? (laughs) Well, I don't know. Maybe she was like, who knows? Like, maybe she on day one was like, why are you dressed like a woman? And then he just 
neglected her after that for judging him. Like, I think there is a movie about her life. So maybe before we, maybe I need to watch that and see how they, if they touch on this. But yeah, who knows? But obviously there's some sexual, physical, emotional, like they're not bonding. They're not bonding. Something's going on nine years. And when your entire point, I mean, if he doesn't have a male heir, he's going to, John Z is going to go to the Brits. So, like, why did it take her nine years to get pregnant? But whatever the situation, our girl finally gets pregnant yes. in 1851. Yes. She would have been, like, 23, which is a nice age. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, love this for her. And I'm sure she would have preferred a little bit earlier, yeah. you know, at well, a hey. cringier age. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but better late than never, yeah. right? This is what she was supposed to what do. Was it was her do. baby boy. Yes, it's a baby boy. Baby boy, you be on my mind. mind. Fulfill my regency. Fulfill my regency. <laughs> we, <laughs> we both, we both sang. They named him Zamadar Rao, and everyone in Johnsy just let out a sigh of relief. Like yes. the British would officially be off their fucking backs now. Like <sighs> until. Uh, tragedy struck and Zamadar died only at age four months. Oh no. I know. Can you imagine like she just spent like nine years trying to get pregnant and then she gets pregnant, has the baby boy on her regency and And it's like, like, oh, but you're a baby factory. Can't you just do it again? And I, she's like, no. <laughs> apparently not. Yeah. Like, so our girl Manu is probably finding herself in a really rough place in life right now. Whole job. The entire reason reason she's there is to have a son so she can keep the people of John Z in the life that they know. Like, I, I, and possibly keep them out of the hands of the British. And her baby boy has died it already took her like nearly a decade to make that baby boy to begin with. So outlook, not great that she's going to have mean, some that, more, you know? I mean, that's an understatement. Outlook, not great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Plus hubby ain't doing too good either. Yeah. Um, Gangahar's health is really taking a hit and we're not sure of what it's just like the quote unquote elderly King. I kept reading elderly King. Dude, he, dude was four. Dude was 39 when he died. Like, let's, that's not elderly. Let's, <laughs> oh let's, God, where's my walker? With I know, my I know, I know. Oh. But still, it's just like one day he gets sick, and it just gets worse and worse and worse yeah. and worse. So oh. it's quote unquote elderly king. Oh, <laughs> the, yes. uh, so it became obvious. Like, all right, we're not having these babies on babies on babies on babies, and I don't got a whole lot of time left. So we need to figure something out. And they uh, decide to adopt, which was pretty common in that culture. Yeah. Uh, We've seen this in ancient Roman cultures. We've seen this multiple places. If you're powerful and you want to succeed and you need to have an heir, no big deal. Just adopt a guy that you just randomly know and be like, yeah. you're my heir. You're my, like, you're that my... just makes sense. We saw, we saw that so much in like the, um, like the Agrippina series Mm -hmm. like yeah that that wasn't and that was super super common in indian culture like okay i'll just i'll just adopt someone legally make them my heir cool so gangadar has a cousin and the cousin has a five-year-old son named anand so the maharaja and the rani adopt him and changed his name to damador rao um yep that is the name of their dead son um which seems (laughs) Therapy. These people need therapy. But (laughs) Gangdar named Damador as his heir and Manu as his regent until he was old enough. Yeah. So the people of Johnsey would have been totally fine with this. Yeah, that's their that's they that's their norm. That's their custom. Yeah. Yeah. We just need to make sure the Brits are okay, right? Yeah. Okay, we've got we've got this adopted kid. Can they back the fuck up now? Right. <laughs> this is going to get tricky. <laughs> yes. So Gangadar and Manu both knew that the British might not accept this setup. So on his deathbed, they invite like the local British officials to come witness him officially adopt Domador. The guy at the local level was basically like, "I don't see. I don't see this being a problem. This should be fine." What 
what could we probably what could we possibly have to argue with this <laughs> Yeah, so in 1853, at around 40 years old, the Maharaja Gangadhar uh, Rao died. He thought he had left peace. Cleaned that up? Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, everything. This is fine. Yes. Spoiler alert, it was not. Yeah. <laughs> we, again, we don't know if she grieved her husband. So we have no idea. We don't know. Nothing leads us to believe that they were close. So who knows? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Manu thought all all the loose ends were tied up. Yeah. She she thought this was done. She's setting herself up. She's got her heir down. She's gonna rule for the next twelve years or so. Um, and it appears that Dumbador moved to court. Manu ended up taking over everything, his education, yeah. his upbringing. Like, it's time to get shit done. Okay, I've got something to do now. It must also be nice to, like, have a purpose. Because if she yeah. was kind of, like, for the last, like, 10, 12 years, just kind of locked up and only people she talked to was her lady in waiting, she was probably fucking bored. And she's one of those gals that's like, uh, she's yeah. not going to get locked down like that. She's like, not oh, a she's not she a with sit it. home and watch Netflix kind of chick. So now she's like, I've got shit to do. I've got the responsibility of educating this boy. She would have, I think, felt fulfilled at this point. It seems like the people really liked her. She was even headed. She was smart. She was tough when she needed to be. And she knew the people had liked her husband's policies. So she was like, cool, let's. Let's just keep, let's just keep doing what we've been doing. No major changes. And everybody was like, sweet. We love this. She's popular. Popular. She's gonna be popular. popular. Yes. <laughs> so, so on that note, literally the note of wicked. Which is great. <laughs> yeah. We'll be right back, guys. Popular. You gotta be popular. Okay. We are back. And mm -hmm. the local British officials who told Gangadhar and told Manu, like, I don't see this being a problem. This will be accepted by the, the British. They were a super wrong. <laughs> and so he took the will and last statement to, like, his boss, a guy named John Malcolm. And Malcolm, and Malcolm was like, hmm, I don't know. I need to learn more about this situation before sending this statement up the up the flagpole, basically. Yeah, and Malcolm did go and check her out and basically was sympathetic. But at the end of the day, his job was to get those lands for the British Empire. You know, if possible. Yeah. And <laughs> so he wrote an objective report to his boss in which he said of Manu, Rani Lakshmabai is a woman of highly respected and esteemed, and I believe fully capable of doing justice to such a charge. I, she would have ruled and ruled for years and years, darling. But basically, the gist of that statement is, I like this bitch, but it's a woman. Uterus. And she's running stuff in her name of a baby king um, who wasn't actually, like their blood relative what is this right like that's right. what the books were saying <laughs> yeah so malcolm's boss the lord general of india was like a woman as a ruler i think the fuck not now nathan what's up who was the ruler of great britain in 1853 oh that was the one and only queen v queen victoria if you nasty <laughs> right and she was a woman if i'm correct right yep Okay, okay, okay. Makes total sense. What whoa, whoa, woman whoa. couldn't possibly rule? Cool, 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 cool. Mm. Nah. It didn't actually have anything to do with sexism. I feel like they just thought, like, if we can find a workaround and we can get yep. in and get their lands, and that's why. That's why I don't, I, I'll give this dude credit. I don't think the Lord General was necessarily sexist. He was just looking for an easy way to grab them lands. Yeah. That, well, <laughs> grabbed him lands. Grabbed him lands. <laughs> oh, so the Lord General appointed a guy named Alexander Skeen to run John C. So he rolls into town and starts, you know, setting up shop. And Manu's like, um, hmm. Deferk? Uh, <laughs> what Deferk? the fuck? Deferk? <laughs> Uh, that Direct needs quote. to be its own just merch. Just something on, just something on. <laughs> Ronnie and John Z. Deferk? 
the fur. <laughs> <laughs> so she was <laughs> she was approached by some Brits, and they're like giving her the lowdown at this, this is point. What's going on? They're like, "Look, you can keep your palace." We love what you've done with the place. It's adorable. So you stay here. You keep it. But, and we're going to offer you a pretty little pension. Like, you're going to live comfortably for the rest of your life. Dumbledore would still inherit all of Gangadar's personal property and money, but no titles, no land. You are just some rich bitch that lives here at our pleasure. You have no power anymore. Every time I read the word titles, it looks like titties, but not them titties. <laughs> You ain't getting them titties. You ain't getting those titles. Nathan, what? I don't know. I don't know. It's been a long week. You're so special. (laughs) Thanks. My mom called me special too. Um, (laughs) How do we think that Ronnie of John Z took this news? Uh, Oh, the answer is not great, Nathan. (laughs) (laughs) She, She said to have absolutely lost her shit and started yelling at the Brits. I will not surrender my John Z. I will not surrender my John Z. Ow, punk rock. She, she is. Yes. Punk rock is. Fun. Yes. Sadly though, there's not anything she could do. You know, no. um, she wrote a letter to complain. She was yield Karen. <laughs> Let me complain to your manager. <laughs> I need to talk to your supervisor and surprise, surprise. Skeen just never sent her letter on to like his boss. So she never talked. She wrote several just being like, and they're, those do survive. Those are like the only thing that survived from her. And they're very elegant and they're very like, they're very well written out, which is unsurprising. She was a very educated woman. But yeah, they never, oh, return to sender. Like, oh, sorry. like <laughs> right. And let's be real. Like Manu had no reason to see her people die over this. Like, yeah, it's, she wasn't going to be like, let's raise an army. Yeah. She was like, let's be cool. Let's see what they can do. If nothing changes on your day-to-day life, this isn't worth the fight. I love that. Uh, Like, I love it. (laughs) She's not wrong because for a long time, nothing did change in their day-to-day life. She's like, I don't (laughs) want to raise an army and have a bunch of you die I know. Over if your if your quality of life isn't going down, so I that's smart. I love that. So for the next year or so, Manu was just kind of left to do her own thing, oh. and she got really into like CrossFit, <laughs> <laughs> Pilates. <laughs> she Pilates. would wake up every morning at five a.m. and work out. She lifted weights. She ran. She did fencing. She. Uh, yeah, bodybuilding, basically. She mm-hmm. loved, loved, loved riding horses. Uh, yeah, she just really got into that, her fitness. That was her jam. Yeah. Everything that I read was like, this bitch lied to ride horses. Like, it yeah. was just, she, she was a horse loved girl. Yeah. horses. And that's yeah. that's wonderful. I love that. Like, I can, I yes. can totally see her and envision her. It's great. Yes. And there's even a story that she started to train an army of women on how to defend themselves. Okay. Yes. Yeah. She taught an army on of women on how to defend themselves. And yeah. it wouldn't have been unusual for her to have female guards. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense. Like, you hey, need to have them pick so up have you a swords. sword or two. Yeah. yeah like a knife or two. Fight. Like, yes. Shankaho, please. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Shankaho 101 with her ladies. Absolutely. I love this for her. I and mean, I think if she was a man, I think she would have a thousand percent been a military general. Oh. Absolutely. Just duh. like her dad. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That is like, he raised her as his son and yeah. she just happened to be a powerful ass bitch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she also got really into charity work. Um, I don't think we're going to go in to the caste system oh, God. of India at the time Rabbit so much um, still there. in this episode because of her, because of where she set in the caste system, she was not expected to do charity for the poor or to look at poor people. Like if she wanted to just never look at a poor person, that could have been her. People would have been like, well, that's your right as where you sit in the caste system. She, but she went, she was like, that's fucking dumb. And she did go and help the poor and she did charity work for the unfortunate. People would have been like, what the fuck are you doing? That is a poor person you just touched. And she's just like, I'm so fucking sure. So like, that is so 
so progressive really yeah people loved her for that because she she helped others she took that shitty situation and made it better yeah and wouldn't it be nice if we could tell you that she lived a quiet nice life of crossfit and pilates and charity and giving to others but but many people do call her the joan of arc of india and you don't get that name from living a quiet crossfit life (sighs) So let's close up this first episode on her by telling you a little bit about some shit that was going down. So we're going to take the focus off of Jonesy and head over to other parts of India. Something you need to know um, about the way that the military for the East India Company was set up. There was a group of Indian natives who worked in the British military and they were called sepoys and they were like lower ranking in the military most sepoys spent their entire careers in, like, the American military, you know, like, private is, like, the lowest. They basically, you don't really meet a whole lot of tenured people in the American military that stay at private, but sepoys didn't have, like, a way to build their rank up. So there was no room for growth, and the pay was shitty. But it's a reliable job. It's a steady and paycheck. And it's a steady paycheck. Exactly. Yeah. So... There were a lot of sepoys fighting for the British Army, and there were 300,000 of these sepoys in the British Army in India compared to 50,000 Brits, so vastly outnumbered. Yes. And there were lots and lots of grievances that have been going on for a long time. But what we're about to explain is just kind of when everything hit the fan shit hit the fan boiling point yeah shit yeah, got it's to like it. we have 300,000 like, and you have 50 why are we doing all this work for you like yes. it's literally the revolt why are we seeing the white people go through the ranks so much faster you know yeah bullshit so now yeah <laughs> india's calling bullshit <laughs> now the two major religions in india at the time are hindu and islam so in hinduism the cow is sacred like mm-hmm. you said earlier they don't really eat a lot of meat um and then in islam They don't consume or really touch pork at all. Like, they don't really use anything made with, like, pig's leather or anything. So that's important to the rest of this story. Yeah, and it's going to cause a fight. Yes. (laughs) And in their military training, everyone at the time had muskets. So you remember ye old trusty musket. You have to like reload it every time after you shoot it. Yeah. Shove the bullet down and grease the cartridges, open it up. Then you shoot the bullet of whatever the fuck a musket is. We're not weapons people. No, but no. So to do the violence, you have to, <laughs> to load the musket, you have to bite the top off of these greased cartridges. You know, open it up and then pour the bullets in. But one day, this rumor starts going around of like, what are these greased with? And so the rumor starts going around, they're greased with fat from an animal. So maybe cow fat or maybe pork fat which would have been against the religion of just about every one of their 300,000 sepoys in the British Army. Yeah, and in May of 1857, a group of 85 sepoys who refused to do the drills, you know, because animal fat, muskets, yeah. not yeah. kosher. Against our religion. Yeah, they were being punished and put in chains. I Like, really, are you trying to... Are you trying to start a revolt? Right. (laughs) Like, are you Barbara? (laughs) So, Barbara. (laughs) British Barbara. Listen. So this was a mistake on the British part because tensions were already high and they weren't reading the fucking room. (laughs) And (laughs) all these people in India are finally like, okay, they come to our country and they don't respect our beliefs. Are they trying to trick us into converting to their religion? They're putting our dudes in chains for not wanting to go against our religion? Uh-uh, Where does this stop? Uh-uh. Where already, does this stop? I'm reaching a boiling point. And this has been <laughs> going on for like 200 years now, you know? So yeah, like, it's it's time for hell to break loose. Yes. <laughs> like, they are done. So done. a group of sepoys storm the jail where the 85 guys were being held and they kill all the jailers but then they go on to find the jailers' families and kill their wives and children. Like, horrible. Which I don't love. I, I don't, don't love, love that. that. 
Don't love that. that. <laughs> I mean, the jailers, the jailers, all's fair in war, but like the 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 kids didn't do shit. It's a you know? vendetta. Like it is a gross vendetta, and we are not here for that. <laughs> so this happened in Marut, India, and the group starts marching to Delhi. So that's not a short march. The whole way along, this made me. This gave me Boudicca vibes. You know, the whole way along marching, they were recruiting people to join them. They were getting more and more rebels, and they were making pit stops to do some more ransacking and killing. But now again, it's not soldiers they're killing. They are killing British children. You no. know, like no one's in the right here. There's no. years and years of grievances, forced policy generations of occupancy and people are just fucking pissed and it's just it, it's they call it the mutiny but it's just it feels like so much more than mutiny when it comes to just like murdering well, it's, it, yeah it's it's generations it's growing of, and growing of, it's yeah. generational trauma oh yeah, for sure that's what oh, it for is sure. it's like generational trauma where it's like you're not taking our land excuse yes. me what yeah <laughs> Yeah. That's exactly the vibe. So it started with just soldiers, but then more and more people who are pissed about these dumbass white people coming in and trying to run my shit. Yeah. So one thing, yeah, one thing I do want to go into, and I'm not going to touch on a whole lot, they were pissed about some of the reform, like all the reforms that they felt impeded on their religious rights. But a bunch of the reforms as a woman, it, it's uh, true. they were good. But just say it, they were good. <laughs> the three big ones that people were really pissed off about, at least that I kept coming across. Maybe there was more. Maybe it's just because I am, the publications I read have feminist leanings or something. Since the British got there, they passed a rule about, <laughs> they upped the age of consent from 10 to 12. Because, the, the, uh-huh. okay, progress. <laughs> yeah. They made it, they allowed women to inherit land like before women couldn't inherit anything or so now they're like no if if somebody wants to leave their stuff to a woman they can leave it to a woman and the one that i spent the biggest i spent an entire day of i took an entire day of research off to, t- to learn about are you familiar with the practice of sati go katie activate uh, rabbit hole <laughs> we are not going to spend too much time on this because this is what um scholars call a big fucking bummer but it it's uh the practice of a man dies if he leaves behind and like when the man dies at his funeral they like do a pyre you know they set him on fire and um uh the the wife if she doesn't have any children is supposed to go and lay down on the pyre with her and with him this and girl is on fire literally <laughs> literally so the oh. british the British outlawed that and they were pissed about that. And so like, I, yeah, the deep rabbit hole that I'm not going to um, tell you everything I learned. It was kind of like uh, amongst the people. It was like, no, but it's an honor. Like it's what you're supposed to do. But then the British get there and they're like, well, if they want to burn themselves on this funeral pyre, why are you tying them up? Why are they screaming and crying that they don't want to do it? You know? And so they made that illegal. Um, so <laughs> all of those reforms are super cool. <laughs> but they're, but also, they're also pissed about taxes. <laughs> yes. So put, but put yourself in their shoes. They're coming here. They're changing our culture, whether it's for the better or oh, worse. No, it's not I'm their fucking business. I'm revolting. I'm revolting. But no, if any, if y'all do want to learn more about Satis, uh, let me know. I, I guess we could do a Patreon episode on it. It'll be a fucking bummer, but let's <laughs> know. Anyway, <laughs> you know what's a bummer? Taxes. <laughs> Taxes are also a bummer. Yes. <laughs> the people of India felt like they weren't seeing enough improvement to their towns in proportion to the taxes they were paying, which yeah. is not an uncommon thing. That's the whole, that's, that's, um, that was America's entire thing. No taxation yeah. without representation, you know? So all of that is going on and word spreads to John Z and it sounds like the mob is coming her way. So she goes to Skeen and is like, Hey, is it cool if I just like build up this army for protection? Maybe, possibly. And he's like, cool, 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 cool. Hmm, nothing's going yeah. wrong here. What could go wrong here? So that's where we're going to leave you for today. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I wonder what happens. Don't Google it. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Cheers, bitches.